Perfect. Um, so today I'm going to give um, this talk I've written, which is called Fearless Refactoring in Elm. I gave this talk last year or so, but the quality of the recording wasn't great, so I've just decided to record it again. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, first of all, hi, my name is Ju. Uh, I was born in China, um, but I grew up in Italy and I have been living in London for the, fast, um, for the last five years or so. I work for a company called Novet Inc. and we teach writing to kids. And you can find me online on Twitter as Arkham with a four. So before we start, I really want to make sure that we all know what this talk is going to be about. And this talk is going to be about this human sentiment that we're all familiar with, which is called fear. Um, so I want to show you this painting. And if we use some CSI enhancement skills, we can see the actual title. And it's a painting by Francisco Goya. And the title of this, uh, well, it's not actually a painting, it's an etching, but whatever. Um, the title of this is El Suene de la Razón Produce Monstruos. And it means that the sleep of reason produces monsters. I think we all intimately know what this means if you've ever done a refactoring in JavaScript because you're all there chilling, you doze it off for a few seconds and bam, you get type error, undefined is not a function. And I think we all know these little beasts and lurking the shadows that are ready to come and, you know, torture us. Um, and I think this feeling is particularly scary when we refactor our code because we know that the goal of refactoring is not to change the code, it's like to change the shape of the code, change how the code is connected, but we ultimately end up breaking the code and therefore we don't do it. And the most we don't refactor our code, um, the uglier the code gets and the more tech depth we uh, accumulate and things, you know, they're just not looking pretty. And I think, you know, when you leave, think, okay, I'm going to refactor this later, you're actually just fooling yourself. You're never going to refactor the code ever again. So I think most of us that like work as professional software developers, we work on products that have test suites and we sort of trust them. They can be fast-ish, they can be medium-ish, they can be slow-ish to run, but we sort of trust them, right? Um, but every time we're making a big refactoring that touches, you know, 20 files across, you know, several different components of the code base, um, I don't think we really trust the test suite to catch all regressions, right? Um, and, you know, this is again about fear, like this whole talk is about this feeling of, you know, being scared and the more you're scared and the more you're doubting yourself. And I think, you know, in the industry, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome, which is, you know, how we feel we are worthy, like our sense of self-worth. I think this is very much related to that. But, you know, first of all, we're not alone in this, you know, Joe Armstrong, which is the creator of Erlang, he was struggling to install Grunt, you know. And also, I think uh, there's like a lot of this sort of thing that, oh, it's me um, and the computer says it's me, so it must be me. And instead, I want to talk about like some alternative approaches. So there was like this article called Speed Without Wizardry, which talks about this exchange between two developers. One uh, rewrote a library in Rust and showed like the performance optimizations. And another developer basically wrote uh, a critique saying, OK, I can write all these optimizations in JavaScript. Uh, in JavaScript. Um, and this was the sort of third message in that chain. Um, and I don't really care about all the details of the benchmarkings. And although the article is very interesting, if you're, for example, if you're interested in Rust and WebAssembly and things like that. But I think what I particularly want to emphasize is um, this thing that, like he says, uh, I, w I wanted to uh, rewrite a portion of our library in Rust, not just for the speed ups, but also for maintainability and to get rid of the clutches added to gain optimizations. So I think this is particularly important. Like we don't want our code to be fast using these insane hacks and insane knowledge about the V8 internals. Right. We want the code to be fast by default. We want the code to, we want, you know, 
uh, even when we're tired and we can't really think properly, we want still the computer to help us out a lot. I think I really like this idea of speed without wizardry, right? And uh, in a very similar vein, I want to talk about, well, I think Rust is very much related to this. It's not just speed without wizardry, but it's also, oh no, I clicked again. Let me go back. Yeah, it's also safety without wizardry, right? Like I don't want to be uh, this sort of always aware ninja that knows exactly what every line of code does. I want the computer to help me out a lot. So for example, there's many solutions out there. What I'm going to talk to you about today is this language called Elm and this, this delightful language for reliable web apps, right? So first of all, it's a strongly typed functional programming language. It's designed to build web apps and it compiles to JavaScript. So your browser will end up running you know, vanilla JavaScript, but you're going to be writing your code in Elm. And strongly typed, I think is something we are all familiar with. It basically means that whenever we call a function, uh, we want to make sure that the arguments that we pass are exactly of the right type. We don't want them to be random types, right? And I think here is a good time to do a little demo. Um, so I'm just going to start with node here and I'm going to define a function called add and I'm going to pass x and y and inside I'm going to say x plus y, right? So now if I call this function, I can pass one and 10, it gets 11. And up to this point, we're all cool. But what if I passed uh, a string to, to this? Well, both got stringified and concatenated, which I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of. But what if then I pass a list? Okay, the list got sort of erased and we stringified one. Um, what about this? Mm, that's weird. What about if we invert the order of the arguments? Okay, sort of similar. Uh, what if I pass uh, an object and nan? Object, object, nan, nan. And what if I pass a number to this? Okay, not a number. But as you see, uh, it takes so much discipline and knowledge of the JavaScript internals to know what each of these lines are going to do. Well, except the first one. The first one was basically the only one which I wanted when I wrote this function. And all these are the side effects that um, I didn't really want, but that the language allowed and therefore people can write and make mistakes in. So I want to show you the same example in Elm. Uh, we can write a function called add x, y, and it's x plus y. And you can see that the first time that um, Elm does is to say, okay, you wrote a function, and this function takes a number, which is x, takes another number, which is y, and returns a third number, which we know to be x plus y. As you, you can see, like the type signature doesn't really say anything about the implementation of the function, but it's mostly about what is the general shape of the inputs and the outputs, right? So we can use this just in the same way. I can say add 110 and it's 11 and it says, okay, it's another number. But what if I passed, uh, like I did before, a number and a string? Now Elm will say there's been a types mismatch. Uh, the second argument to the add function is not what I expect. And it highlights what is the problem and says, okay, the type is a string of type string, but it needs to be a number. And you see like in this way, there's so many errors that the compiler makes impossible, right? Like we can't really write this pro like bug in our code that bug is gone forever so the same thing if i pass an empty list will say okay uh, this is not what i expect this is a list but i want a number and i think this is like uh, the much striking difference between working in a strongly typed language and a loosely typed language like there's so many errors which are just impossible you can't write them in your source code okay so um, the thing I mentioned before, that weird thing with the arrows, that's also called the function signature. Mm. And you can see that um, it's not really magic. It's just saying, okay, I'm taking an integer, I'm taking another integer and returning a third integer. 
And I think in the case in the REPL, we had number, which is a sort of more generic type and integer is more restricted, but you know, it's the, the same sort of reasoning applies. Um, there's also this idea in functional programming, which is called currying, which m basically means uh, partially applying a function. So we know that add takes two arguments, but we can only just pass one, for example. And in this way, it's sort of like we're storing this one inside the function. And then you can see that in the third block of code, we can call this function by just passing the second argument. So like what previously was y. And you can see that this add one has sort of stored inside that uh, one um, uh, into itself, right? Um, and actually, if I have to be truthful in Elm, a function can only just take one single argument. And you'll be, well, like I just saw a function with two arguments, right? Um, but even in that case, uh, it's actually just doing one argument. So when you see int, 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 you can actually just see it as int and these parentheses, and this function returns another function, right? So for example, whenever we called add one, we just did this. So we passed one here and we got this other function that takes an int and returns an int. So in, you can see like this is sort of this partially applied function and it's waiting for this uh, one. Okay. Um, and uh, I wanted to just like make a couple other examples of function signatures because I know like they're, you might not be familiar with them. So this is uh, um, two lines of JavaScript. This is the, you know, new syntax of JavaScript. Uh, you can define an array with one, four, nine, and 16. And then you can say that I want to map this array and each element needs to be multiplied by two. So you can see like this is the, exactly the output, right? Um, so we can write the same thing in Elm. We just say array is one, four, nine, 16. By default, the array is a const. So um, there's no need to specify that. And then when we do that map, we just say list map. This is the syntax for creating this anonymous function. So. Uh, is like this backslash x and then after the arrow there's the body of the function and then we pass the array you can see like this is exactly the same thing uh, i just wanted to show you uh, also the type signature of this list map so list map is a function that takes this first function and then takes a list of a and returns a list of b so i think if you look at this type signature um it really helps you to understand what map is doing. It has a function that transforms A to B. I pass a list of A's and I get a list of B. So let's say A was an apple and B was an orange. I pass a list of apples and I guess uh, a list of oranges. I think this is like a really nice way to, you know, also document what your function is doing. Um, so for example, I could write this function called double everything, which takes a list of int and returns another list of int. And inside I just do this, right? And I just do list map x, x multiplied by two of this list. And this is was our function. Um, and the type signature is very generic right now. It's like A to B, A and B but I can also make it specialized. So I can say that it doesn't take any A, it returns any B, but only returns, like takes an int and returns a string and it always converts a list of int into a list of string. But the interesting bit is that if I look at the implementation of this specialized map, you can see that I'm just calling this map. So in this way, we're sort of constraining the type to make it more specific. And in this way, we can eliminate a lot of errors because people could be passing weird things, but I want my specialized map to only take integers and only return strings, even though the implementation uh, is exactly the same. So in this way, you're sort of helping the compiler to remind us of the constraints uh, that our code has, right? Um, so uh, for example, now if we look at this specialized map, we can see that um, we can pass a function which is string from int, which takes um, an integer and converts it to a string. 
So if we look at the, if you think about the type signature again, it's something that takes an int and goes to a string. So we're basically doing the same thing. We're taking an int, we're converting to the stringified version of that integer. So you can see that when I call this on the numbers one, two, three, I get the strings one, two, three. Um, so why is this useful? This is useful because if I called specialized map and pass the function, which for example, in this case, I'm just doubling the number, right? So it takes an int and returns an int. This thing uh, will be type checked by the compiler and the compiler will say, this is not right. You know, like you pass me a function, which is an anonymous function of type one, like int to int, but you told me just before the specialized map is a special function that converts an integer to a string. So I think this is like really important because we can give these hints and these hints will be enforced forever by the compiler. Like we'll never make a mistake ever again in writing something like that. So that's what, how I think about function signatures. It's like this little like childhood game where you have to fit the square into the square, the triangle into the triangle and the circle into the circle. So it's just basically making sure that all the pipes that are connecting uh, our functions are always connected together. I think in object oriented programming, sometimes you write some tests to ensure that the shapes of these things are right. But if you forget to write the test or if things change, um, it's quite painful. Like, I don't think it's very um, sort of pain free to have those tests. And instead, when you're using a strongly typed programming language, you get all these checks for free. You don't have to write those sort of integration tests. Um, and at this point, you'll say, well, but there's some arguments that can be null. You know, like, how do you handle those? Well, I have some pretty bad news. So in Elm, there is no null. So I want to give you an example, which is, uh, let's say we want to grab the first element of a list, right? Uh, it's called list head, and we get a list and we return this weird value, which is called a maybe. And this maybe basically encapsulates the idea that the list could be empty. So if I try to get the first element out of an empty list, that is not a value, like that would be the null case, right? So if I do that, you can see that we return this special value, which is called nothing. And instead, if I call this head on a list that has uh, values, then it's going to return one, just one. Okay. So this is how that maybe uh, value uh, works. It can either be nothing. So this indicates the absence of a value or a just, which indicates, okay, there is a value and the value is one. And if I have to write that myself, I would say, okay, this is a type, it's called a maybe A, and this is the sort of type variable. It could be an int, it could be a string, it could be another maybe. And these are the actual values that can populate this maybe, it can be a just with a value or nothing. And the way we use it is like, whenever we're calling this head, Let's say we want to write a function that takes the first element of a list of integers and transforms it to a string. Uh, what I call it, I have to use this case expression to pattern match against the return value. So I'm saying I'm calling this list head. It can be either a just or a nothing. In the case of a just, I'm going to take this value and to convert it from uh, integer to a string or otherwise I will have to handle um, this error case and say, you know, in this case, I just put like an error message saying, I'm sorry, uh, like the list was empty. I couldn't do what you asked me to do. And instead, for example, like this is a very similar thing in JavaScript where, you know, you do that. And if the array is empty, undefined is not a function. So instead of nulls, we always have maybes. Um, this is a quotation in Greek is by a certain philosopher Archimedes on the equilibrium of planes. And he says, give me a place to stand on and I will move the earth. Right? So, um, my version of that would be give me the types to write with, and I will refactor with confidence. You know, I think it's, uh, this very simple idea, just like a lever, uh, but 
if you apply it systematically to your project and to your code base, it has this incredible um, dividends. And uh, we just saw a maybe, and maybe it's a sort of default type, but you can also define your own types. So for example, if we imagine we have two kinds of users in our system, we have students and teachers, uh, we could have a field called kind that describes that, right? So we could say um, the user title, and in the case it's a student, I return student, in the case it's a teacher, I return a teacher, right? But when I write a function like this, there's no guarantee that it's actually going to be these values. Like I have to be very careful to pass exactly these values to this function, right? So for example, if you make a little typo and you write student with an M, or what happens when you add another kind of user, you want to add the admin user, right? More beasts coming out from the darkness, right? Um, so instead in Elm, the alternative is to make your own data types, just like the maybe data type that we saw before. And in this case, there will be no variable. I just know it's a teacher or a student. And it looks very similar, the code to the JavaScript version. But I think the fundamental change is that I cannot literally pass anything else here but student or teacher. So if I, I can't make a typo, if I make a typo, the compiler will tell me, okay, student is not a thing. Maybe you meant student. And also let's say in the future, if I added a new admin user kind, then this case comparison will break because you will say, okay, there is a type which is admin that you didn't take into consideration. So basically you can't make typos. So I just want to show quickly some like real life examples of code. Mm. Okay, so let's see this. Um, so I, this is like a very simple um, Elm application. Uh, I will basically ignore most things, but you can see that we have a view function and this view function controls what is shown on the screen. So for example, if I said, hello, Jew, and I pressed compile, will compile that and type hello Jew. Oh, by the way, I'm using Ellie app. So you can play around with it and just like write your own Elm programs without having to install anything. And you can see that like a lot of like, there's like some glue code that makes sure that actually the HTML is generated and everything. Um, but I think this is not very much fun. Instead, I want to show you another example. So I've written this small program in Elm that generates random Mondrian paintings. And you can see it says, hello Mondrian. And for example, here I could change it and write hello Jew. And if I do compile, it will do the same thing and regenerate a new one. I think I've wired it up so that if I click, it just generates a new uh, Mondrian painting, right? Um, and you don't have to care about most of the code. I just want you to focus on this little color type. So if here I was to add a new color, that's called green, um, and I compiled this, we can see the errors. It says, okay, on line 164, this case are not, does not have branches for all possibilities. So if I click here, it will send me on this case comparison and say, okay, there's a function called color to string that's checking the color and it's emitting a string, probably I need to implement this, right? So if I do that, I'll just say, whenever you get into green, just print green. And you compile it, you'll say, oh, wow, the code fixed itself and now it works. But if I click a few times, you can see green is not really appearing. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that just because the code type checks, it doesn't mean uh, it works exactly as it intended. So the type checking gives you this sort of, you know, sort of like pipe checking, you know, like the, that childhood game, uh, but you can't really ensure that the program is exactly working the way we want to. And in our specific case it's because I randomly generate all these colors. And I think um, in one of these random generations, you have also to, um, add the possibility of green being present, right? So if I do that and I compile, we should be able to see some green as well. You can see it appears there. But I still, still think this is quite great because if I were to make a typo, right? 
it would say, oh, I cannot find Gree. It has to be one of these. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, fine. Compile, and now it works. Cool. So we've done that. Let me go back to this. Um, and now the question is like, well, but can you use it in production? You know, like this is all fun until it's, you know, all games and all, but like, can you really use it to, um, you know, deliver value? And uh, of course, <laughs> uh, our product is used by millions of students and teachers every day, and it's all written in Elm. So in Elm in production, what does it mean? We've been, I think, five years at this point in production, um, around I think now it's like around 200 million requests per day. And I think now we've gotten more Elm code than that. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, tests as well. We're going to take a look at those later. Um, and is it safe? Yeah, so these are the unique exceptions that we get in JavaScript. So we still have some JavaScript running uh, in the code base. And you can see these are unique ones. So we, you know, um, group them by name and type. And in Elm, I think now we have a couple because they were caused by some design choices, but I think the difference is quite staggering. Um, so I want to make another small demo of this. Um, so my small demo is here. Uh, and I want just to quickly show you a couple like small things. Um, so first of all, I'm in the repo with all the no reading code. So I can just search find dot dash type. Uh, no, I think maybe I, oh, well, I guess type um, file name Elm. Maybe I'll just search uh, into the UI SRC folder and I'm going to do uh, WC dash L. Uh, and you see there's uh, 1016 files. So if I was to um, xargs cat, uh, xargs, cool. You see now we have 270K lines of code. Uh, let me just quickly check inside tests. Now it's like 163K of tests. And if I were to check inside the whole UI folder, so including Elm libraries, uh, we have almost 800,000 lines of code uh, written in Elm. So all this code is automatically type checked for you. So for example, I just wanted to show you a quick example of like some real life code, right? So if I look at the code like this, it's uh, one of our products and this is one of our functions. And the sort of same experience that you get in the small demo is also reflected here. So for example, if I was to just delete this block of code, see what happens. Okay, you see there's been an error and the error says that the case does not have branches for all possibilities because <laughs> I just deleted it. And the same thing would happen if I make a small typo, right? If I make a small typo, you're like, okay, uh, I cannot find this title MS. Did you mean title MSG? You're like, yeah, I did mean that. And instead, if I save this, you'll see that everything works, right? Um, and for example, if I checked on the browser, you go to a local host, you're like, oh, no, I didn't start the server yet. And it's like, this is such a common occurrence in my daily work that I'm doing some refactorings and I'm reshaping how this code works. And then I realized I didn't even start the server. So I've been doing all this work uh, not clicking in the UI. I've just been doing this work by, you know, working in the code. Um, cool. So I wanted to show just like some quick examples. Uh, I think this uh, have all been done last year, but you know, like we've been refactoring some types and you, it's very common to make these commits that are huge, you know, like you change thousands of lines of uh, code and you know, you're confident when you're doing that, like you're not scared, you're not afraid because the compiler is there and it's making sure that all, you know, like your pipes are connected properly. Um, and you know, there's like more of that. Um, I forgot to just like show you some other like little thing which I really like, which is for example, we have some button components. Um, so let me just get like, you know, any one of these and you can see that, um, no, let me search for button large. 
Uh, and you can see that we have this small UI library that we use to show some buttons. And you can see that here I say that it's a large button, right? But maybe I wanted a medium button. And you see the medium button, it works just fine. But what if I make a typo? Then it will break saying, oh no, you can't do medium. It has to be one of these, medium, premium, delete. So all your libraries uh, are have like this amazing property. You know, imagine one day we were to add uh, a new type of button, it'd be the button tiny. And instantly everyone who is using that uh, is going to be able to use that. But not only that, like let's say one day we wanted to rename this to something else. Uh, we would have to fix all the references to this medium because otherwise the whole build won't pass. So you're basically guaranteed to make these sweeping changes across the code base and for this change to be reflected everywhere. And I think it's like something which is incredibly powerful. So um, there was like this really nice article written by Evan, which is called How to Use Elm at Work. So I just wanted to quickly show you um, what it is about. So there's like many ways, for example, to use Elm within a React app or just, you know, to try it out into smaller pieces of the code base. And I really recommend to reading this if you are curious and want to try it out. Um, yeah, I think that's all. You can find me on Twitter as Arkham with a four and this is my GitHub um, username. So yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.